Um, in this episode, we'll be looking at Myth and Education, uh, an essay by Ted Hughes um, that I've taken from Winter Pollen for the Faber edition from 1995. And we'll be looking at uh, the, the, the first part of the essay uh, that talks mostly about the education part and why Plato uh, suggested that uh, children be taught the myths, uh, despite the fact that Plato and his followers were very much against, uh, they wanted to kick the poets out of the Republic. I'm skipping right to the second paragraph so we don't read out the whole essay. Plato was nothing if not an educationalist. His writings can be seen as a prolonged and many-sided debate on just how the ideal citizen is to be shaped. It seemed to him quite possible to create an elite of philosophers who would also be wise and responsible rulers with a perfect apprehension of the good. Yet he proposed to start their training with the incredible fantasies of these myths. Everyone knows that the first lessons with human beings, just as with dogs, are the most important of all. So what would be the effect of laying at the foundations of their mental life, this mass of supernatural figures and their impossible antics? Later philosophers throughout history who have come near often enough to worshiping Plato have dismissed these tales as absurdities. So how did he come to recommend them? So I know uh, Marco uh, was prepared to give just a brief for people who don't know who Ted Hughes was. Yeah, so just quickly, uh, Ted Hughes was a 20th century British poet, essayist, translator, and children's storyteller. Uh, he was born in 1930 and died in 1988, 1998. Sorry, he was born in rural uh, Yorkshire uh, and grew up in a largely rural setting. And he's quoted as saying that the first six years of his life were the most instrumental to sort of forming his imagination and, and, and his vision. Um, of, of life in general, he was uh, deeply enamored with hunting and with fishing, and he regarded fishing as almost like a religious experience for him. And his father also fought um, at Ypres, Flanders Fields, in uh, 1915 and 1916, and so he grew up hearing stories about the horrors and the carnage of war. And so, I mean, his, his inner life, obviously, from the very beginning, had a really... Um, uh, intense education very early. And so you can kind of see that reflected in the essay, Myth and Education. Right. And I wanted to point out that, you know, if, if anyone, you know, it, popularly speaking, uh, Ted Hughes was the one who wrote The Iron Giant, which was turned into a film and mm -hmm. is a very, very popular children's book. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, his poetry is extraordinary. It's up there in the rankings of the truly great poets of all time. So yeah. with reverence, we continue to look at uh, this extraordinary essay that he wrote. Yes. Well, one should also note here that he studied anthropology. He left, uh, he, he went to study English originally, and um, he, he writes an essay also in this collection uh, that's collected in Winter Pollen, which is a collection of his essays, where uh, he sort of famously uh, he's writing an essay for an English course, uh, so a literary essay, and he has this nightmare that he wakes up from in which uh, a fox has come to him and left a bloody paw print on the door on the window or something like that. And uh, the, the, it, say, it says, you're killing us or you're killing me, I can't remember. The uh, idea being that the process of literary analysis was deadly to appreciating the beauty of poetry and literature. Mm -hmm. it, and what scared him too, sorry, I was just gonna say like what scared him too is that he recognized in his college days that he was actually very good at textual analysis and it scared him that if he pursued this path, it would just destroy his, his creative integrity and his imaginative impulse. Yeah. So he became, he went into anthropology as a result. And I think this essay also gives us a sense of a, an anthropological perspective as well as a literary perspective, but it's, it's literature seen as anthropology, as sociology. Uh, so it's imp the impacts of literature of uh, things that train the imagination and why this is essential in the education uh, system period. But especially he's saying we need to uh, get the imagination. We need to get kids creative early and we need to uh, instill uh, 
uh, the stories that make up our culture, to anchor them in the uh, tradition. And of course, there's that deeper idea. Uh, I think we discussed this thing in, in a previous conversation where I brought up Ion and uh, Carl Jung's observation that as we, a culture that detaches itself from uh, the tradition, uh, the moorings of tradition, uh, winds up in, in the situation that we find ourselves in now, where without roots, we experience a societal crack up, like a, a schismatic sort of uh, almost schizophrenic type of crack up where you're dissociated uh, rationally and you fall into the irrational claiming that it's rational. Mm -hmm. So, and just, sorry, just to put one more little po point here is that one thing that Ted Hughes was really known for was his shamanic approach to poetry and including his readings where you can hear the voice that he summons to read his poems is extremely shamanic. He really reaches into your body when he enunciates and speaks his poems. Yeah, let me jump back just a little bit to mm -hmm. what the beginning of this piece. You mentioned it, Asa. Plato wanted poets suppressed. But he doesn't say why. Do you, do you know why? Have you read Plato and found out? So yeah, I'll, I'll let Marco pick this up because he just uh, ran to the Republic to take a quick peek at the reference that Hughes was likely alluding to, and it's definitely problematic. So mm -hmm. we'll touch mm -hmm. on it, but I don't want to get stuck on no, that. No, no, I just yeah. I was wondering. Yeah. It, 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 it uh, confused me a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want us to get stuck either because I actually uh, got stuck, and so I think when um, Hughes uses the word suppressed, he doesn't necessarily mean outright 100% banned, because uh, in book two and three of the Republic, Plato sp specifies, or Socrates specifies, that it's not that the poets should be entirely suppressed, but they should be tightly regulated by the state and authorized only to tell certain myths in certain ways, right? So the poets, Plato recognizes the poets as essential, but they need to be directed towards the specific myths that are going to shape the imaginations of the youth and make them prepared to defend the state in the future. Um, and then other, other myths should be absolutely, um, and, and the poets should be punished if they don't stick to the state guidelines. And directed towards the public good, presumably. That's right, that's right. So for example, any, any myths which depict the gods behaving in immoral or selfish or violent ways should be suppressed. Any myths which show heroes behaving cowardly, those elements of the, of the text should be excised. And he even takes, Plato even at certain points takes Plato and Hesiod to task. Or sorry, he takes Homer and Hesiod to task, saying that there are parts of the Iliad and the Odyssey which are magnificent, and then there are other parts which must be forever excised. So, <laughs> of course, a poet can't lie. That's right. Any any myths which show the heroes and the gods uh, behaving fearlessly, um, expressing their um, lack of expressing their fearlessness of death, um, expressing their temperance, um, expressing their 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 superior moral virtues as outlined by Plato, those are acceptable. But any others uh, are not. It sounds kind of like how they uh, dealt with the poets during Soviet uh, Russia, uh, where like people like Maxim Gorky and others that don't really matter as much now. We're all writing about, com you know, the the workers' revolution, the proletariat struggle, uh, kind of thing. They weren't allowed to say much else. So I guess that would have been their their wet dream, right? Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah, so there are very strong linkages between uh, Platonic um, philosophy and the Republic and uh, communist experiments and uh, authoritarian um, experiments as well, or just regimes, uh, which we'll talk about, I think, at a different juncture. But let's yeah. just take Hughes instead of Plato here and yes. say, OK, he used Plato as a springboard there might be something a little bit uh, misleading to someone who's trying to understand Plato, but let's try and understand Hughes rather than try to understand Plato here. Um, so there's a bit of a misdirect 
uh, there from a the scholarly perspective. But it doesn't really matter to the points I think that uh, Hughes is, is getting at here. So the question follows, I'll read now from paragraph three um, after he says, so how did Plato come to recommend these tales? They were the material of the Greek poets. Many of them had been recreated by poets into works that have been the model and despair of later writers. Yet we know that Plato thought about poets. Sorry, we know what Plato thought about poets. He wanted them suppressed. Much as it is said, he suppressed his own poems when he first encountered Socrates. If he wanted nothing of the poets, why was he so respectful of the myths and tales which formed the imaginative world of the poets? He had no religious motives. For Plato, those gods and goddesses were hardly more serious as religious symbols than they are for us. Yet they evidently did contain something important. What exactly was it then that made them, in his opinion, the best possible grounding for his future enlightened, realistic, perfectly adjusted citizen? Let us suppose he thought about it as carefully as he thought about everything else. What did he have in mind? Trying to answer that question leads us in interesting directions. So uh, he continues, he says, Plato was preceded in Greece by more shadowy figures. They are a unique collection. Even what fragments remain of their writings reveal a cauldron of titanic ideas from which Plato drew only a spoonful. Wherever we look around us now in the modern world, it is not easy to find anything that was not somehow prefigured in the conceptions of those early Greeks. And nothing is more striking about their ideas than the strange visionary atmosphere from which they emerge. Plato is human and familiar. He invented that careful, logical, step-by-step -step style of investigation in which all his great dialogues are conducted, in which almost all later philosophies developed until it evolved finally into the scientific method itself. But his predecessors stand in a different world. By comparison, they seem like mythical figures living in myth, dreaming mythical dreams, and so they were. We find them embedded in myth, their vast powerful notions are emerging like figures in half relief from the massive of myth, which in turn is lifting from the human animal darkness of early Greece. And there's that anthropological shamanistic vision of, of Hughes. Why did they rise in Greece and not somewhere else? What was so special about early Greece? The various peoples of Greece had created their own religions and mythologies, more or less related, but with differences. Skipping ahead a bit, he says, then at the beginning of the first millennium, they began to converge by one means or another on Greece. They came from Africa via Egypt, from Asia via Persia and the Middle East, from Europe and from all the shores of the Mediterranean. And of course, he's speaking of the stories and the myths coming from all of these places and converging on Greece. Meeting in Greece, they mingled with those rising from the soil of Greece itself. Wherever two cultures with their religious ideas are brought sharply together, there is an inner explosion. Greece had become the battleground of the religions and mythological inspirations of much of the archaic world. The conflict was severe and the effort to find solutions and make peace among all those contradictory elements was correspondingly great. And the heroes of the struggle were those early philosophers. So with that, I figure we can start to make some observations of that insight. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to jump in or should I sort of <clears throat> lead with some thoughts? Is it, yes, go ahead. I think it's probably best. Well, so, you know, I've been studying this essay for, I don't know, at least five or six years. And I would say that what's especially interesting here is that he seems to be suggesting that the origin of the philosophical mind, the mind that starts asking questions about, you know, what is the fundamental uh, first cause of the universe? What is the fundamental element of the universe? What's everything else made of? Is it water? Is it air? Is it fire? Right? And we had all of this in the pre-Socratics. But where does the inspiration even think those thoughts begin. And he seems to be implying here that it's from this convergence of 
comparative, a sort of comparative mythology, what I would call the birth of the analogical mind. And this leads us to some ideas that we've been looking at in previous episodes of, of Daymakers, where we're looking at perception and how it works, redintegration, this idea of analogy, of seeing two things that resemble one another and finding a concept emerge from this so that you get abstractions, abstract ideas emerging from comparative stories. That's what I'm seeing here. And so if you have like five different stories about Venus, you know, and one of them's, you know, about Astarte and the other one's called Venus and the other one's called uh, Ishtar, whatever the names might be from all these different places. Uh, and they're similar stories and someone might twig and say, wait a second, these are the same stories. How did that happen? And what is common to them? And suddenly you get abstract ideas from finding these, these points of convergence. Um, are all myths, I mean, you, you mentioned that they came from Africa, um, from the Middle East and from various other places. Do they all have something in common? Do they all, all, are they all ways of explaining um, natural phenomena? Uh, where, does, where does the thunder come from? It comes from a god. Um, what what will make the crops grow this year? It's we appeal to this god and so on and so forth. We, we, we make our offering. Have they all got a similar? Are they all about uh, ex an explanation of natural phenomena? Um, just they just vary a bit. Well, I think. yeah. I, I find that it's a what's very what what it is. A, what's important to them is that they have a a national a nationalist slash theological hold or ability to mold these pe the people of Greece or like that's the idea I think you know mm. something like that because as Hughes says later um, every real people has its true myth does that suggest you, you mentioned that nationalism I think it's probably an ism it's not the right thing here but a, a feeling of oh, I just what I was trying to say is that if he keeps a if you keep the poems about the people, about religion, like the gods and stuff like that, uh, they, that is good for family union. That is good for strength in the place. So that's why I think they, they wanted that. And the other thing is that I think Plato, deep down, really kind of wished he could write poetry. Maybe he did already, but he, he denied it. But I think he, what he likes about it is that he thinks of poets as people that can touch into what they might think, even though Plato might disagree, is something divine, especially yeah. epic poets. Right. Well, I think what, what, what enabled all of these seemingly uh, disparate myths to converge and to blend into new myths, into new ideas, is that there was some, there were confluences between them. I mean, they're, they're, they're different on the surface, but I think deep down they reflect universal truths about human nature and the human condition. And also they, they, they open up possibilities for the analogical mind, which is essential for, for scientific advancement. And, and, and so for example, like uh, I was reading recently a, a, a literature from a doctor who was suggesting that there's something, there's something analogical between the nature of the human digestive system and how nutrients are, are, are dispersed to the body to enable its survival and its growth. And the way that, for example, like the, the ionosphere surrounding the earth transforms or digests cosmic energy and then redistributes it to the planet. So it's not an exact analogy, but I think these myths, because they link the inner and the outer world and they link the material with the immaterial, the spiritual with, with the bodily, like you can you can discover these you can make these analogical connections and that helps not only the imagination to advance but also scientific ideas uh, uh, and our understanding to advance does that does that make sense yes i think the yeah. two points here um i think probably this this text is it's not a very good hasn't got a very good title because most of it is actually about this this conflict or this merging of the inner and outer worlds um, and the way we, we look at it, particularly the way modern man looks at it, um, it's got an awful lot to say later. So I think the myth, myth part is really only his starting point. And I think um, uh, it talks so about... Stephen, do you think, sorry, Stephen, do, do you think it's about 
the merging of the inner or outer world or about using myth to awaken us to the intrinsic connection? Between well, uh, ideal. I mean, he quotes later, quotes, um, quotes Gersh at one stage. Uh, he says, what we need is an inner vision which keeps faith with the world of things and the world of spirits equally. Well, that's not quite the same thing. But what he said talks, what he said later is the faculty that makes the human being out of these two worlds, i.e., the, the inner world and the outer world, is called divine. And this, divine is the word that, that, that Mark used uh, a while back. But that's why I want to just focus right now on this idea of why teach children myths. And I think what I see here is he's saying you teach children myths in order to reenact uh, in their, as a foundation for their minds, what went down in Greece so that they are able to write that conflict of many stories, many tales from many nations converging together in their minds. And out of that, you get a frisson, you get a creative uh, elan that explodes out of that. Mm -hmm. And it becomes the rich soil from which they are able to think philosophically in the future. It's, so these are in fact models or um, archetypes that they can then relate to their own lives. Yes. Something and, and, like that happened to me, uh, Daddy, and um, is that what happens at the end? You know, then they can relate it to what they've got to do. Well, and, and, and uh, Hugh specifically says that engaging with those myths for the child is the very beginning of imaginative and mental control, right? So the way that Hughes is defining imagination is perhaps somewhat different than the common understanding of what imagination is. I mean, people tend to associate imagination with just pure fancy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so much of our understanding of the world and our interaction with the world is, fun is basically coming from our most essential mental tool, which is imagination. So th there's a passage uh, just a bit later from what Asa was reading. So a, a child takes possession of a story as what might be called a unit of imagination. A story which engages, say, Earth in the underworld is a unit correspondingly flexible. It contains not merely the space and in some form or other the contents of those two places. It reconciles their contradictions in a workable fashion and holds open the way between them. The child can re-enter the story at will, look around him, find all those things and consider them at his leisure. In attending to the world of such a story, there is the beginning of imaginative and mental control. There is the beginning of a form of contemplation. Okay, so what do you guys think? Like, what? How does Hughes understand imagination? Like, based upon this this passage? Well, I think as you pointed out before we started recording, there's this. Um, it's it, imagination is generally taken to be a negative thing in a, in a, uh, a culture that perceives itself as uh, practical. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they, uh, they, they just dismiss uh, imagination as fantasy. And they dismiss the idea of imagination as fancy or fantasy or something delusional. Mm -hmm. And as a result of distancing themselves from the idea of imagination, they, they cease to realize that in fact, we use the imagination as a primary tool for perceiving the world around us. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to make things especially understandable in this moment, when we see uh, projections about the outcomes of COVID, that is imagination. Mm -hmm. And you might want to you know, say, well, we're using data, but we saw how the data was completely flawed and the projections were completely flawed and out of touch with reality. Mm -hmm. And here's the problem is that they're, they're using that same type of thinking again, even though it proved to be false in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's because they keep thinking that they're looking at data when in fact, what they're doing is they're using a form of imagination. Mm -hmm. Now, just because you've made a picture of it on a graph and you used an Excel sheet in order to generate something imaginative, it doesn't make it any less imaginative. Mm -hmm. I think a uh, little later on, he uh, shows this, uh, this might um, clear it up a bit. Those with no imagination are dangerous, ruthless slaves, sorry, ruthless slaves to the plan, and the plan about everything should be planned. And then he says, those with no imagination and a defective 
sense of reality are also dangerous. So this is what what he's saying here. If you've got to, you've got to be have both parts of, of the human being working at the same time. Mm -hmm. Correct. And he also, I mean, he says that we never actually, nobody ever gets it clear or we get it clear only very rarely or for, for small snatches of time. But one of the other things he says is we all know those people who need rules and who are rule makers mm -hmm. and they are very destructive people. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, you know, an, another thing that uh, will come up more and more as, as this conti uh, discussion continues, and especially when we start relating it to the uh, adventures of Baron Munchausen when we're able to get to that. But uh, let's not get sucked into that. Let's mm -hmm. stay on this, this idea of the imagination, just to parse it a bit more. Now, one of the things that comes to mind for me is this wonderful short story by Joseph Conrad called The Typhoon. Has anyone read that short story? No. It's all about, I mean, he, he, it's one of Joseph Conrad's favorite themes is this problem of people without imagination. But this story in particular, Typhoon, focuses on a, a sailor, a, a captain of a ship, who sails directly into a typhoon because he just can't wrap his head around the idea of how bad it could possibly be, even though he's read all about it, even though he understands the dangers. <laughs> And of course, you know, this is being related by a first mate or something who just, he can't believe what he's being driven into by someone without imagination, straight into a devastating storm that is going to rip them apart and destroy their, their lives. And so I, I found, you know, that analogically worthwhile mentioning in this context. Right. And so, so, so when a child is, is taught or is encouraged from a young age <clears throat> to live inside the world of a story <clears throat> and to look at the various parts of the story and to contemplate them at, at, at his leisure, over time, he's able to, to draw links between causal links um, and associative links. And he's able to see that story as a whole so that one single part will draw up the entirety of the story. And this gets into redintegration and analogical thinking. And so this, this character in the story that you described from Conrad, he doesn't have that power. He doesn't have that skill. He doesn't have that imagination that would have been trained through to reading the old myths. Is that He can't connect emotionally to the idea to the ideas of devastation that have been, that he's read about. Uh, so there's, a, there's something missing. He can't bridge between the, uh, all he sees is the technicality of, well, that's where we're headed. That's how we have to go uh, to get to our destination. And that's all he sees. And it's like, well, typhoon or no typhoon, you know, I've been sailing the seas for, you know, 20 years and blah, 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 blah. And he just, yeah, he can't connect. There's a, a disconnect between the physical and the uh, and the practical. Okay, so um, okay, so with that understanding of of the imagination, I think we're starting to get a, more of a sense of where he's headed with this and why it's essential to teach this to young children. So maybe we can get on to the next idea that he actually brings. can you can you a question. Yeah. Can you teach it young? Can you teach it to young children? Or well, you just read the stories to them, right? Just read the story, yeah. Just expose them to it. With pictures and artwork. Yeah. yeah. And I think you can also talk, I mean, if you're a parent or if you're an educator and you're reading mythological tales or fairy tales to children, you can also talk to them about it after. You can talk to them in such a way where you're not necessarily directing them to think about it or to interpret it, but you're encouraging them to to imaginatively interpret what's happening and to try to understand within their own primitive kind of logic what's happening, then you can nourish that in, in, in such a way that they're encouraged to develop their own understanding. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think you're right. What it's supposed to do is teach them to think for themselves or to, to lay the groundwork for, for thinking for themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. But why did, you know, the why did the um why did that person have to be punished in the end which is a common thing in fairy tales or you know why did they they didn't do anything wrong why were they punished by the gods for you know just doing what seemed right mm -hmm. so there, mm -hmm. there's so much going on and so much questioning that starts at a very early age that that prepares them for things that they're going to have to confront later but you know this is that problem between um
between prescriptive and descriptive and uh, what happens when you you try to prescribe instead of describe life you, you know you you get too far into the abstract and, and ideal and not into how life actually operates and that becomes extremely oppressive mm -hmm. you, say, you begin to forget about the person because all you're thinking about is the the prescription well, I think what the one of the key elements here is this idea that came up in our discussions about Bergson that the the ideal idealism leads to an, uh, a sense that the world is a static place. It's a sort of monism, as opposed to the flux uh, wherein we all have to grow. And if we're all supposed to immediately understand what's right without going through errors, without making mistakes, without uh, going through that, then there's no acceptance of self-development, right? If you're not free, you will be forced to be free. It becomes the, the way a society functions. And of course, that's, that goes entirely against ideas of self-development, which allow people to make mistakes and to grow from them without punishing them for being human, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the, the capacity for uh, critical... Uh, independent thinking, of which imagination is a fundamental part, uh, can be nurtured and developed through the reading of the stories. And and like it, it reminds me of what Hughes was saying before that like Greece was a kind of place of convergence for all kinds of different disparate myths, and it was it was the early philosophers and 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 the storytellers who managed to find a way to reconcile uh, the, these these disparate stories. And so like, whereas a person with no imagination, somebody obsessed with planning, like the person in the Conrad story, these so-called health experts who are determining our lockdown policies, um, what, what, what their vision is narrow is because they don't, what access to all of those different myths and the convergences uh, between those myths, what they enable you to see is the many different possible paths that can be taken. And so the entire range of possibilities is open to you with imagination, whereas without it, you can only see one way of doing things. Well, and this whole idea of the inner and the outer experience of the world. So they're only seeing um, uh, not just a narrow uh, data set, which is horrifying in itself, because even by their own logic, they should have a wider view. But one of the main things going on here is there's no acceptance or understanding of the psychological impacts, the impacts on, on people's inner lives of how this is destructive to, uh, you know, why, you, why destroying a society for some sort of book cooking is not ethical. They don't understand ethics because they don't understand the interrelation between the inner and the outer experiences of the world. <laughs>